بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنم علينا يا عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قول أما بعد All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and peace be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I testify that there is no God except Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah Brothers and sisters in Islam with tonight to be the last night for the marriage course we continue with what we left you with last week as we spoke last week about the proceedings of the marriage contract. And we mentioned the conditions of that marriage contract and then what are the consequences and the outcomes of this marriage contract. Today, inshallah, we shall continue with what's after the marriage contract. And we mentioned that the marriage contract has main conditions. Those main conditions are to have the bride and the groom and someone to, to represent the bride two male just Muslim witnesses and the terms to be exchanged by the two parties and a dowry to be mentioned in between and this is, these are the main concepts or the main conditions of marriage. Now, the reason, that this, the reason that Islam mentions the importance of having witnesses, this is what differentiates between zina for example and marriage because zina people do it behind people's backs but marriage is something that you announce. And that's why announcing the marriage is also an important part. Announcing the marriage is an important aspect in the actual Islamic marriage. You've got some scholars like Imam Malik who considers announcing the marriage is more important than the witnesses. Why? Because the whole idea of marriage is to inform others that now I am married and this woman that I'll be living with, she is my wife. And that's why announcing the marriage is a very important thing. You have people these days... They'll take one part of the religion and forget the other part. They'll take, you know, I want to get married, but they keep it secret. This is against the concept of Islam. It's against the essence of marriage to, to close this marriage and not disclose it and not to announce it. So this is another part. Now, after getting married, there are things that, will, that, that, that change with that marriage. There are halal, okay, there are things before... Marriage were halal, now they become haram. And there are things before marriage that were haram, now they become halal. Now, the things that were haram before marriage that become halal, of course, this woman before marriage, she was a stranger to you. This man before marriage, he was a stranger to you. But now after this marriage contract, now you become husband and wife. And what was not permissible before that, in which sitting down with her, being in a, 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 a isolated uh, gathering with her uh, and the rest of the things were haram before the marriage but after the marriage contract they become halal now there are also matters before the marriage contract that were halal but now they become haram what are the things that were halal before marriage contract and now they become haram before the marriage contract some of her family members were halal for you to get married to but after the marriage contract those family members become haram on you and that hurma that hurma, that forbidden, is divided to two. One in which the scholars define as hurma mu'akata, which means temporary haram, and the other hurma mu'abada, permanent haram. The temporary haram, it is haram on you to get married to her sister. Yani it is haram on the man to marry his wife's sister during her marriage. Okay? So this is temporary haram. It is haram on him to marry her auntie or niece or any of her close relatives. Why? Because this brings enmity within the family. But that hurma, that forbidden, will be taken away if this woman is divorced and then her idda is gone through. It becomes permanent haram. It becomes permanent haram on the husband to marry her mother. This becomes permanent haram. And this permanent haram 
will apply from the moment the marriage contract takes place. So from the second that the marriage contract takes place, the mother, the mother of this woman becomes haram on this man forever. Even if he divorces her. Even if he divorces her a minute after that. He, can get mar- he can't get married to this woman to the day of judgment, to her mother. Same thing if she has a daughter. Okay? Same thing if she has a daughter. But we'll come back to that daughter. It becomes haram on her to marry her, his father. Her father becomes haram on this woman to the day of judgment from the moment the marriage contract takes place. And this hurma will also lead to that the husband can see his mother-in-law the way he sees his mother. Which he can see her without hijab. He could give her salam, she could kiss him, he could kiss her. As we have some of the customs that take place between different nationalities and different traditions. And same thing with her. His father-in-law or her father-in-law becomes haram on her to the day of judgment from the second that the marriage contract takes place. And that hurma also will lead that she treats him like her father, in which he can't see her without hijab. He could be alone with her and so forth. Allahumma ali, if there, sometimes you have abnormal cases in which you don't trust, maybe, uh, maybe the father-in-law is not the best of people, then that becomes a different case and that's a different matter that can be dealt with. Now, if he also has children, if he also has children and she is married to him, then also his children become haram on her to the day of judgment. And she becomes the stepmother from the moment that the marriage contract takes place. Now, coming back to her daughter, if a woman has a daughter and then she gets married to a man, this daughter becomes haram on him, not after the marriage contract. It becomes haram on him. She becomes haram on him after the marriage is, inco- is consummated. So this is the only different part, or this is the only different ruling applies when she has a daughter from a different husband. Then she gets married. Then she gets married to this man. Not from the second the marriage contract takes place, this daughter of hers becomes haram on him and she becomes haram, and he becomes haram on her. This hurma will take place. And it's also a permanent humra, a hurma. This hurma will take place, this forbidden act will, or this forbidden uh, thing will take place not after the marriage contract, after the marriage is consummated. What's the marriage consummated is after the sexual intercourse, if we say it in a blunt word. Okay? So this is in regards of the hurma that takes place and in regards of what happens after uh, the marriage contract. All becomes haram after the marriage contract except the, the daughter of the wife. The, she becomes haram after she becomes haram after the marriage is consummated. Now, now, of course, Islam draws the line between the husband and the wife and the wife and the husband and what are the rights in between one another and this is a matter that we want to discuss today. No doubt that this woman has rights over the husband, this man has rights over this woman, the children have rights and these rights have to be taken care of because they are responsibility in which Allah will ask you over in the hereafter. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to, the Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam, he used to always say that fear Allah azza wa jal with those women that Allah had given you, they are the trust that Allah will question you about in the after. So this woman that you get married in this dunya, it's not something that wallahi you could play around with <coughs> and walk off and think wallahi you're not going to be accountable ever it la by Allah. You will be accountable and she will be accountable. And for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And live with them in a dutiful, live with them in a responsible, live with them in a respectful life. And in this verse alone summarizes and gives us the understanding of the rights of this woman over this man. Allah Azza wa says, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And he also says, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and these women also have rights to be re- treated with respect, to be treated with responsibility like anyone else. 
These rights, my brothers and sisters, are divided to different categories. There are combined rights that both the wife and the husband are responsible in. And these combined rights starts off with uh, this combined right starts off with that both will inherit one another, both will inherit one another after the death of any of them. So if the husband passes away, this wife has the rights to inherit him in a portion that Allah Azza wa Jal had mentioned. And if she passes away, this husband has the rights to inherit her in a portion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned. Both have the rights of the children, that these children are both, the, uh, these children both belong to the mother and the father. They don't belong to the mother alone or the father alone, as some system might divide 70% for the mother, 30% for the father, no. Both have the rights over the equal rights over those children, but different responsibilities. And both, okay, and also, يعني, excuse me if I say that, both have the rights to enjoy with one another. Both have the rights to entertain, in other words, with one another, and I don't want to go further than that. Also, there's the combined right in between each other, and both should encourage one another to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to encourage one another to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. These are the combined rights between the husband and wife that both have equal share in this matter and both should work together into making this happen. Now let's speak about the rights of the husband. The rights of the husband over his wife. Okay, The rights of the husband over his wife, first of all, that she obeys him in, which, in matters that obey Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is something that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had emphasized in many times. Not because the man has more iman than her, or he is closer to Allah Azza wa than her, but the woman can beat that man in many areas to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because that man has more experience in life than this woman, the man is more exposed to the outer world than the woman. And every single one of us he knows that. That you are all out in this world, you experience, you hear, you deal, you buy, you sell, you, you live the outer life than this woman. So you have the more experience to deal in matters and to be cautious in many more matters in life than this woman. And this obedience, it's restricted to the obedience of which is only that obeys Allah Azza wa Jal. فَلَا طَاعَةَ لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ There's no obedience to the creation to disobey the creator. So if one day the husband orders his wife, if one day the husband orders his wife to do something that disobeys Allah Azza wa Jal, she has the full rights to reject that. And she has the full rights to continue doing what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that also includes stopping her from seeing her parents, for example. Okay, he could limit, he could limit the number of times that she might go, but he can't stop her from seeing her parents because that's a duty. That's an Islamic duty upon her that she must take care of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make her responsible of. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that any woman that, passes away, uh, any woman that passes away and a husband is pleased from her, she will enter the paradise. And he also says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any woman that prays her five daily prayers, she fasts her month, she protects her chastity and obeys her husband, she will be told in the hereafter, enter the paradise from any gate you will or wish. Also, I, once a woman came on the behalf of a group of women coming to speak to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Afwan. A woman came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaking on behalf of a group of women saying, Oh Messenger of Allah, that the men have the chance, the opportunity to go out in jihad, to go out and do more things that please Allah, to go out and gain more hasanat, to go out and do this and do that, in which the women don't. So these men had the opportunity to make more hasanat than us. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, go, on the, go and inform those women that he came on their behalf and say to them that any woman... Any woman that wants to please Allah Azza wa Jal and obey her husband and please her husband, she had managed to do all those things that the man does himself, does 
that the woman can't get the opportunity. In other words, that you're talking about the jihad and you're talking about the hajj and you're talking about all these matters that a woman can't do, then to get all these rewards, she'll get it by obeying her husband and pleasing him, of course, in which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is also his rights over her that she protects, her chest, uh, she protects his honor, which is her. She doesn't mix with, a, uh, with anyone that her husband tells her not to mix with. Or she speaks to the opposite gender in which is forbidden, and this is a great matter in Islam. And also she protects his wealth. She protects his wealth. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that no woman has the right to let anyone into her husband's house without his approval, regardless. And it becomes much harsher when it comes to a male. And no man, and, and, and no woman is it permissible to let anyone enter, uh, the, uh, how the, enter the house, into her house that her husband dislikes. So this is a duty that she must fulfill and a right that her husband has over her. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also describes the best of women that when her husband is not there, she protects him with her honor and she protects him with his wealth. And this is another responsibility that this woman must have, that she is responsible to maintain and take care of his wealth because his wealth is always, his wealth is there and she's present around his wealth more than him. He's most of the times he's out working, doing this, doing that. And his house is his wealth. His furniture is his wealth. And many of that, that's his wealth. A lot of the money that's kept in the house, that's his wealth. Of course, sometimes that wealth is divided. But that wealth, is, that wealth, she is more present around his wealth than what he is present around his own wealth. So it's her duty to take care of her husband's wealth and protect his wealth in his absence. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, فَالصَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَافِظَ اللَّهِ They protect the absence or the unseen, which means in the absence of a husband, بِمَا حَافِظَ اللَّهِ in which Allah Azza wa Jalla protected. It is also his right for her to look good in his presence, for her to, um, for her to, Present herself in the best possible way, in the most beautiful manner to her husband so her husband can be attracted to her. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salatu wa sallam, he forbade the men to go into their houses at night before the family knows about their presence or knows about their arrivals so the wife could prepare herself and not look in a manner that her husband will be turned away from her. And this is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized so he could keep the love in between. And this is a, also a joint right that the man should also do in return. Look in the best way, in the attractive way towards his wife. As Abdullah ibn Abbas said, by Allah, I try and look the best and the most beautiful and attractive way to my wife as she also does the same thing in return. Also, it is his or it is her duty to her husband that she takes care of the household as we mentioned and whatever is needed in the household from cleaning, taking care, of course, on an average base. But yani, yani, a husband can't expect to get a palace and get his wife to do the whole work for herself. Yani, There's something that will be reasonable. And most important is to deal, uh, to deal with him in which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to deal with him in which will get her closer to Allah azza wa jal. Now, speaking about the rights of this woman, of this wife, over her husband. We spoke about the rights of this husband over his wife. Now, we'll speak of the rights of this wife over her husband. Her main right, of course, for her husband to be dutiful, respectful towards her. And Allah Azza wa said, وَعَشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And deal with them in the best manner. To deal with her with the respect, to deal with her in a high quality of manners, to deal with her in a way that you like your own daughters or your own sisters to be dealt with. And this is something that many people do forget. They are willing to deal with other people's daughters on a low class. But if it's the own sister, they will refuse if anyone speaks to them in a manner that they would not accept for their own sisters. But they'll say it to their wives. 
the way you like your sister to be treated, you must treat other women because they are the sisters of other people. Also, her main right also, expense. Expenditure applies on this man. He is the responsible one to spend on his wife. He is the responsible one to feed his wife. He is the responsible one to clothe his wife. He is the responsible one to shelter his wife. That responsibility starts from the moment that he does the marriage contract. She becomes his responsibility to shelter her, to provide the house for her, rent, buy, whatever. It is his responsibility to provide her with food. It is his responsibility to provide her with clothing. It is his responsibility to provide her with furniture. It is his responsibility to provide her with the necessity things of life, like, for example, soap, shampoo, and all the rest of the things that a woman might need, comb, and all the other things that every other average woman might have. It, that's all the responsibility of man. Of course, this responsibility could go, for example, I could, someone might spend on his wife $100 a week, someone might spend on his wife $1,000 a week. So what's the limit? Average. The average spends on this woman like the rest of the other women. Like, for example, here living in our area here in Sydney, an average woman in Sydney, what does she live on? What does she need? You provide her with that. You can't say, but I got her from Lebanon. Okay, average woman in Lebanon, she lives on 100 bucks, so I'll deal with her in Sydney 100 bucks. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay, where she lives, you deal with her the way you, the other women are dealt with. An average woman here, she lives in a respectable house, a house or a flat of two bedrooms. She has a furniture of, uh, you know, average price, whatever it is, four or $5,000. She has an average food like every other woman. Okay, you can say, but in Lebanon they used to eat every day full. Khalas, I provide her with full every single day, that's it. No, no, no. You look at the place that you live in and the place that you are settled in and you provide her like every other average woman. You don't have to provide her like what a king provides his uh, queen in, the, in, in a different country. No, you provide her with an average, uh, uh, sustain, or you sustain her with average things in, 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 uh, in a normal, uh, in, a, in the place that she's settled in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal, uh, he says in the Quran al-Kareem, أَسْكِنُهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ سَكَنْتُمْ مِنْ وُجْدِكُمْ وَلَا تُضَارُهُنَّ لِتُضَيِّقُ عَلَيْهِنْ oh, Provide shelter for them. Uh, in which you have found, uh, found and do not be harsh or harmful towards them. Also, the Prophet ﷺ says, It is there, it is your responsibility over them to provide them with rizq, which is food and all the things that follow it, and also the clothing. So, this is the responsibility of the men. Adding also to the responsibility that it is his responsibility. To protect her, to take care of her, and whatever needs she needs, whatever needs she needs, she gets that needs whenever she is in need of that. So he doesn't, it's her responsibility. He spends a bit of time with her, average time that she is in need with, to sleep over her house, not well, like just to have her in one place and use and abuse and throw. Okay? She's not like, you know, a tissue that you use and then you throw. No, she has respect, she has honor, and she has that respect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anyone else. And she is a responsibility from Allah azza wa jalla before anyone else. So she has that right to be taken care of, to be protected, to be looked after. As you might take care of anything in life, she must be taken care of like everyone else. Now, so these are the simple responsibilities that apply between the husband and wife and the wife over the husband and the husband over the wife. And it all goes back at the end. Not one like restricting ourselves to these rights. Some people get married and they restrict themselves to the No, I don't want to do more than that. No, it's, Islam doesn't tell you just do that. Islam tells you this is the lowest you go to. But Islam tells you go above that. You have to do more than that. You know, Islam encourages you to do more than that. But you can't get under this red line you know it's your responsibility to uh, maintain to always to be above that red line and whatever you do for the sake of Allah Allah Azza wa Jalla will give you and also ikhwani, if you want to have a happy marriage if you want to happy uh, want to have a happy life then this marriage this happy life would not continue only if there is the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jalla and that's why the most important thing that you need to focus on 
the most important thing that you need to focus on during the marriage is that you focus on how to get each other close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to get each other close to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Because Allah Azza wa has promised a happy life with the fear of Allah. Allah Azza wa says, Man amira salihah min dhakr na untha wa hum mu'minun falan nuhiyan nao hayatan tayyibah. We'll make them live a happy life. Whoever does a righteous deed from male or female believer, Allah said, we'll make him live a happy life. So this happy life that you want to get out of marriage, you only get it through pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal. You ask an average person, why do you want to get married for? Of course, they're not going to say, I want to get married to be stressed and sad. The, the main thing is in their life, it's a moment they look forward to because it's the most happiest moment in their life. Then it becomes the most miserable moment in their life. Why? Because it's not based on pleasing Allah Azza wa It's not based on getting close to Allah Azza wa It's not based on the fear of Allah Almighty. And that's why, ikhwani, marriage, if you want to get the best out of marriage, you need to please Allah Azza wa Now, Another important point, it is his right for her to wear hijab. Hijab, it is honor. And that's why the man has the right to enforce hijab as a, over his wife. Of course, when I say enforce hijab, not bash her to put hijab. You know, enforce, you know, to ask her to wear the hijab. This is what I mean by enforcing the hijab. You know, to ask her to wear the hijab. That's his right. You know, I want you to wear. And she, to please Allah Azza wa Jalla, she got to obey her husband to wear the hijab. Okay, so enforcing the hijab here. Is not wallahi forcing it. Enforcing the hijab is asking her to wear the hijab. It is right. It is right for his wife to wear hijab and not to expose her to anyone that he does not want except her, maharam, and the women that she lives around. Last topic we speak about is divorce. Of course, divorce is a matter that Islam does not encourage of. And there is a weak hadith the might reach to the level of Hassan in which the Prophet Muhammad says, Abghadul halal ila Allah talaq. The most disliked halal to Allah is talaq, divorce. But in some cases, marriage doesn't work out. Not because he's bad, not because she's bad, maybe the best of people, but different mentalities. Okay, he comes from the east, she comes from the west, and they just can't get along. The food, one wants chili food, the other one wants to, you know, cool food, the other one, you know, likes. Uh, likes the heat, the other the one likes the cool. Subhanallah, you know, there's different natures in life that people can't get along with. And uh, sometimes people resort to divorce not because, well, like, they're the worst of people, she's bad, he's, he's bad, or she's good, or he's bad, or uh, she's bad, he's good. It's because khalas, it doesn't work out. And that's why Islam opened the door, okay, that the last resort they resort to is something called divorce. And this divorce, my brothers and sisters, sometimes is also because she's bad and he's good. Or he's bad and she's good. Sometimes, you know, they end up married on a good basis and then he becomes bad and she can't continue her life with him or he can't continue his life with her. So Islam had opened that door. You have some religions, there's no, there's no something called divorce. He's stuck with her to the, end of his, to the rest of his life and she's stuck with him. So what do they do? Okay, at the end, what do they do? They start doing things from behind each other's backs. This is reality. Islam had opened the door, and Islam had opened the door of divorce. But divorce is the last thing that you resort to. If there is a dispute between the husband and wife, they should always come to arbitration. Both try and sit down, try and work things together with one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, in the Quran Kareem, mentioning that if the woman goes out of the orders of her husband, Allah says, فَعِذُهُنْ Sit down and speak to him. Try and solve this matter one-on-one. -on -one. Not, Wallah, get, khalas, take the decision of the... But try and solve this matter. Okay, look, we disagree over this. I dislike what happened. I want you to listen to me over this matter. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, no doubt that when you get married, you're not going to get married to someone that's going to come to your mind 100%. Because you don't even agree with yourself 100%. To agree with other people 100%. Okay? But sometimes when you see a fault in the opposite side, a wife sees a fault and a husband, a husband sees a fault and the wife, always work on how could you fix that fault but not make a big deal or make a problem out of it. And sometimes when there is that fault, the best way to deal with that fault is to choose the right time and right place to mention or to try and solve, uh, to try and fix that fault. So when the husband walks in angry, okay, and you see that's a fault in him, don't expect him, wallahi, to get rid of that fault on the spot. 
But maybe the wife should have a bit of patience a few days later and discuss that matter with the husband and say, look, I don't like the way you walk in, for example. Or the way that you dealt with this matter, maybe the husband then will accept. It is the nature of mankind that people don't like to be cornered or being put on the spot right away if they're not dealt with hikmah. So Islam always encourages that when there is a problem, there is a dispute, to arbitrate, to sit down, to encourage one another, remind each other about Allah Azza wa Jal, remind each other about their responsibility, remind each other about how to live together as a happy family, try and work out matters. If it doesn't work, then Allah Azza wa Jal said, uh, the Allah Azza wa said, فَهْجُرُوهُنْ If it doesn't work, then the husband tries with his wife, he could turn his back on her and not speak to her for a few days to make her feel to make her feel that he is really upset. Not Allah, to torture her. Some people, I want to torture her this way. No, no, it's not about torturing. But sometimes people only wake up through some matters like that. And then Allah Azza wa says, Fadri Buhun. Of course, here yeah, some people grab this word, Fadri Buhun, and Allah again grab a baseball bat and huh, start hitting, smashing her face and punch her in the face. Guys. No, 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 no. It doesn't go that far. No, we need that. Islam is against that. Islam is totally against that. Then what's Fadri Buhun in Quran Karim? Nabi Sassam explained that a touch on the side. Okay, even though that's not even encouraged because the Nabi Sassam never did that in his life and Nabi Sassam does not even encourage that. And I don't even encourage you to do any of that, but the explanation of this Fadri Buhun is a touch, a touch on the side. Like, you know, wake up, I'm upset from you. Okay, maybe this touch to show anger will mean to this woman, Wallahi, huh, he is really angry. Okay, so this is where it means Fadri Buhun. Oh, as I mentioned, it's not also, this is not something well, like Islam encourages to do because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi never did himself and uh, we, did not, we did not even hear the Sahaba doing it themselves. As a Muslim, you should deal with your wife, you should deal with your husband in an appropriate manner. If the matter does not get solved, then Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran Karim, bring a man from his family and bring a man from her family. Let them sit down and discuss the matter to arbitrate. Maybe through two different parties, they'll sit down and discuss the matter. They will resolve this matter as a judge both will come and make the judgment over the two. So this is that why we we'll resort to arbitration. Or come and bring it to the sheikh, for example, or sit down and have a counseling or a session with the sheikh and we should discuss this matter with him and try and come with a resolution. At the end of the day, it's something that people have to give and take. Sometimes the husband wants to take, doesn't want to give, or the wife wants to take, doesn't want to give. No, no, it's something that both have to need to come into a, a, a neutral agreement, a mutual agreement, and both must give and take to the best of uh, interest for both. Allah, we all, as a, we all have to understand, I mentioned this before, that marriage is a sacrifice, and marriage needs patience. So don't expect Allah to walk into marriage and khalas, everything becomes easy. Like, to earn that hundred dollars, you need to work eight hours for it. But then when you see that hundred dollars, how it's you happy. But you got the hundred dollars after a long day and long hard, a day of hard work. A long day of hard work. Same thing, if you want a happy marriage, you need to work for it. You need to sacrifice, you need to have patience, you need to swallow things, you need to do things. So, you know, Allah doesn't expect Allah to sit at home and always frowning and not speak to your wife and expect Allah to have the best of marriage. And same thing comes to the woman, wallah, you know, wallah, she sits at home, does nothing, and expects to have the best of marriage. No, marriage is sacrifice and patience. It needs a lot of patience, as you, might, uh, as you need patience for a lot of other things in life. If the matter only will resort to divorce, then Islam draws the line for us on how divorce works. And this is one of the customs of the Arab they used to have before Islam. They used to have something called divorce. They pronounce the word divorce and then the divorce. But before Islam, they used to divorce a thousand times and they still bring it back. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam restricted it to three times. That a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, the message of Allah, I divorced my wife 1,000 times. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, three for her and 900 and 97 on you. Sure, 1,000 times? Sure, it became. So Islam, resor- uh, Islam restricts Islam restrict the divorce to three. Okay? Three times. Okay? Three times. This divorce is what when someone says to his wife, you are divorced in English or in Arabic, and Okay, In Nabi Sallallahu he mentions about divorce that the three things, its seriousness is serious. So if you're serious about it, it's, you, it's serious. And if you're joking, it's serious. So if someone Allah, is smiling and they, with his wife sitting down on the balcony and he, you know, he says, you know, I want to try this on you. You know, you are divorced. You know, just trying it. She's divorced. 
doesn't work that way. Even if you're mucking around, we'll apply. Okay, so divorce is not a word that you could play around with. Divorce is not a word that you could play around with. So you have to be very serious. And when it comes out of the tongue, you're responsible for it. Whether you're angry, whether you're upset, whether whatever, you are responsible for this. The only time that the irresponsibility of divorce is taken away is when you reach to the stage in which you become so angry that you don't even know what you're talking about. And that's very rarely happening. Everyone knows what they're talking about. You have to, and you have to be like some, some lunatic that halas, you're blind. That after he's told you, what, if you divorce, you divorce? Did you, did you know what he just told you? Oh, no, I can't remember. Did you know that he told you? Oh, no, I can't remember. And, it, and that's very rarely happening. So then use that as an excuse. Wallah, if I get angry, I could say tomorrow I'll divorce, but then I could pull it back. No, 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 no. It's going to be accountable on you. And when you divorce, when someone says to his wife, you are divorced, okay, then the divorce takes place. Okay, the way it works in Islam is three to time, three divorces at three different times. So no matter how many times you might say it once, it's considered to be one divorce according to a lot of the scholars. Some scholars will say, no, if, if you say it twice in one place, that's two divorces. You say it three times, that's three divorces. But the majority of scholars these days, because of this problem, they say, no, no. It doesn't matter as many times you might say in one place at one time, it's considered to be one. So if someone divorces his wife, that's one divorce. If he divorces the second time, that's the second divorce. If he divorces the third time, that's a, that's a third divorce. And I'm talking about different times. When I talk about different times, and it just doesn't have to be, wallahi, today, one divorce, tomorrow, another divorce. For example, if he says divorce in the morning, and then in the afternoon he says another divorce, that's a second divorce. When we mean a different time, it means a different place, different session. And the session is considered that in one gathering, that's one, one session. But in that, if that gathering ends and someone walks and comes, then that's a different time now. It's a different session. But Islam also knows that a lot of mankind, Allah Azza wa knows that mankind is very weak. And someone might divorce his wife and then regrets. Afan Shabab. Someone might divorce his wife and regrets, and it happens a lot of times. And that's why Islam gives him the chance to take his wife back in the first divorce. So if someone divorces his wife the first time, or divorces his wife the second time, that are still their responsibility. That wife is still the responsibility of this man during her idda. What's the idda? It's three bleeding cycles, starting from the first bleeding cycle that she gets after that divorce. And that three bleeding cycle could exceed up to two months, three months, four months, depends on that woman. That's if she, gets, if she bleeds. If she doesn't bleed, then it's three months. Okay? And some women, when they reach the age of 50, they stop bleeding. Okay? So it's three months. If a man divorces his wife and then the, he regrets, he still has the right to take his wife back. And he says, okay, come back, you are my responsibility. Okay? If he divorces her the second time, he still has the right to take her back as long as she's still in her idda, in that three bleeding soccer, she could come back to him. But if he divorces her the third time, then unfortunately he can't take her back. And the only time that she will come back is if she gets married to another man and then one day, whatever happens between them, should they get divorced, then after that, you could take her back to you. So that's why, my brothers, divorce is a serious matter. Divorce is a serious matter. And it's not a game they could play around with. And that's why when, you, when it comes on your tongue, grab it. Go and consult someone before you say it. Because you're going to regret later on. And believe me, a lot of people regret. And a lot of people might divorce their wives three times, and they don't even realize that, and they're just living together in the haram. And divorce, you don't need a witness. So if the man just tells his wife she's divorced, she's divorced. Even if he's sitting down between himself, there's no one around that. He says, I divorce, you know, whatever, my wife and this. He's, halas, she's filled divorce. Even if there's no one around, he's responsible for it. If it's only on his mind, it doesn't apply. Only if it comes on the tongue. So if he, if he pronounces the word divorce on his tongue, even if there's no one around, she's divorced. And if he says that to her face to face, there's also a divorce. So he doesn't need witnesses for that to take place. And if he does divorce his wife, then she is divorced. If it's the first time or second time, and it's during the idda, he could take her back. During the idda, if it's the first or second divorce, during the idda, he is still responsible for her. She's still his wife. 
who he must take care of, shelter, feed, and uh, clothe her during the Iddah. After the Iddah, then everyone goes their way. He has no right to take her back. And if they want to come back and they just got divorced the first and second time, then they have to go through a new marriage contract and start all over again from the beginning. Start all over again from the beginning. Now, now the divorce, the pronunciation of divorce is divided to two types. One divorce is called straightforward divorce or clear divorce. And this only applies with the word divorce or talaq. Divorce or talaq. In, in Arabic, they also so, call it firaq or tasrih. Okay, this is the clear divorce that when you say the word divorce, does anyone understand anything besides divorce? Talaq. Does anyone understand anything besides talaq? Then when you say that, whether you have intentions or not, it applies. There's the other type of divorce called unclear divorce, which could mean divorce and something besides divorce. Like for example, go away, I don't want to see you anymore. This could mean divorce, it could mean something else. Go back to your parents' house. This could mean divorce and could mean something else. Uh, I don't like you anymore. This could mean divorce. And uh, get out of my face. This could mean divorce, could mean something else. This divorce will fall if you have the intention from behind the words that you just said. So if someone has the intention from behind, get out of here, uh, go back to your parents' house, and it means from behind it that I mean divorce, then it applies as divorce. So this goes back to the intention. But the clear divorce, intention, not intention, applies. You meant it, you didn't mean it, you were serious about it, you are joking, it applies. So this is in regards of that divorce. This is in regards of a divorce. If he divorced the first time or the second time, he has the right to bring her back, and she is still responsible during the idda. If he doesn't, then, then everyone goes their way, and if they want to get married, then they do a new marriage contract. If he wants to bring her back, Raja'a, all he's got to say is come back. And she's back. He doesn't need to witness, but it's good if he witnesses people and say, look, I want you to witness that I'll bring my wife back. With her acceptance, not acceptance, he could bring back his wife. Okay? Or any action that shows that he accepted it. Like, for example, he divorced her, and then they went and they started to kiss, for example, touch each other. That This is a sign that he wants her back. That means she's back. And she is his responsibility. He lost one divorce, he's got another one. If he loses the other one, he's got one more last one. He messes around with that last one, that's it. Everyone goes their way. Everyone goes their way. And as I mentioned, she is still his responsibility during that time. Now, who has the rights of divorce? The man. Does the woman have the rights of divorce? Yes. But through the sheikh, through the qadi. Allah Azza wa also given her that right. But it's the qadi that has it on her behalf. If the woman one day is not too happy with her husband, and she sees things in him that she's not too happy with, as he has the right to divorce her, and to go his way, she goes his way, uh, he, he, go his way, she goes her way, she also has that right, but she's got to go through the one with the authority, which is the Qadi. she got to him, she say, this is my situation. He will look into the case, and then the Qadi can make the judgment and divorce her from him, even if he doesn't accept. If the case, of course, is valid, that Allah, she makes up a story, she makes you know, a wonderland story and then wallah, she, wants to get, she wants to seek divorce from her husband. So this is something that Allah Azza wa Jalla has given her. And this she also got khula. Khula is when she's got no rights or she knows that she's got no rights. She wants to get her wife. He wants, and she's, look, she can't, maybe he's good but she can't live with him. Khula is when she offers him money or she offers him something in return for him to divorce her. Okay, and this is a matter that also has got to go through the Qadi or through the Sheikh in which he looks into this matter and discusses that matter. So divorce is a serious matter that you can't mess around with or play around with. And while I think that you'll get away with it and not be accountable. No, it's a responsibility that you must be serious of. And it's a responsibility that you'll pay a big price for. And a lot of people, a lot of people take it easy and then they regret. So you have to be very serious with that regard. And lastly, inshallah, not taking much of your time. Remember, Ikhwani, pleasing Allah Azza wa Jal is the key of success and happiness. And if you want to be happy, I please Allah Azza wa Jal. If you want to happy, be happy, follow the orders of Allah. And that's when you find a happy marriage, with a happy outcome of this marriage. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us. Inshallah, next week we continue with you with Hajj course, inshallah. Next Thursday, we'll have the Hajj course because we'll be leaving to Hajj the week after that. So inshallah, we'll finish it off with a marriage course today. And inshallah, if any of the brothers would like to ask questions, please ask. And if you'd like to email, we could email with well, shady, S-H-A-D-Y, shady, S-H-A-D-Y, at uma.org.au, shady, at uma.org.au. If any of the brothers shall would like to ask a question, please ask. Yeah. 
انت هي اولويز انجري انت و و like you're angry and you say finish if you meant from behind the divorce yes it's divorce if you meant from behind it but if you just trying to threaten her get scared it's not divorce uh, happens huh Allah I think last year it out yeah okay some scholars might look at some scholars like the Malikis they say it's a uh, it's a volunteer from her she volunteers to do that but most of them say no it's her responsibility and Allah alam, it is her responsibility to take care of the household of course on the average level okay on the average level no Allah yani, to come and do maintenance and build a house no on the average level is it haram for her to work okay for a woman to work it's halal for a woman to work if she works in an acceptable environment. Like, for example, she teaches females, for example, or she works in an environment where there's only uh, females, or there's males, but there's not that intermixing, or things get overboard and that. Okay, now, is the wife allowed to work with her husband's consent? Yes. If he says no, then she doesn't work. Okay, she doesn't work. So he has the rights to tell her not to work. Naam. Of course, yeah, the as I said, marriage is give and take. And it's not Allah stubborn about it. I want to have my freedom. She's not allowed to have a freedom. I mean, this is command. A lot of the brothers sometimes go overboard in that matter. They lock the lock up their wives in a cage and that's it. Huh, whatever I want. No, it doesn't work that way. Islam is much bigger than that. Now, any other question? Yes, brother. If they separate for a long time, no divorce, they're still married. Like, you know, they've been separated for a year or two years, but he hasn't pronounced divorce on her. They're still married. Three years, ten years, they're still married. Until he announces divorce. But, and of course, she's, you know, if he goes for that long, she should at least ask for divorce if he doesn't want to participate. Okay, one of her rights to ask for divorce is when he doesn't spend on her. Like, if a, if a man does not spend on his wife, she can ask for divorce in return. And what does the Qadi does? Like if, and if you get this, the Qadi's duty is to give him three days. Look, if he does spend on it from here to the next three days, I'm going to take it away from you. Okay, and it'll take it away from you. It'll, I'm going to divorce it from you. Okay, so this is one of the things that a Qadi has the right to do. Now, of course, see, that's your right. If you will lie, you know, buy me a car every second day. Or buy me a jewelry. That's up to you, sure. Tell her to get to her father. Tell her to buy her. <laughs> la, la, la. La, it's up to you. If you want to say, buy her, buy her. That's, that's your decision. But it's not her right to come and demand things every second day. or demand. But at the same time, it's her right to demand for something every here and then. And it's gonna be, as I said, it's something give and take. And the husband can say, I'm not going to get anything. Well, I dream about it. You're not going to get anything. No, no, it's got to be reasonable, okay? And every here and then, if she asks for something, you give her. You know, but if she's wallah, ever exaggerating, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want that, no, this is, doesn't it? What was it? His situation, he can't. It depends on the situation. <laughs> See, with divorce... There's a lot of things that apply. Depends on the situation, and it's harder. You have to study the situation, and that. Can someone get second wife? Can someone get second wife? I believe it's a wrong thing. I mentioned that before, and uh, announcing the marriage is more important than the witnesses and some of the scholars. I say, what's the point? Having a second wife and keeping it secret. That's wrong. Keeping a secret from the wife. No, that's wrong. Okay, I'll make it clear. To get married to a second wife, you don't have to get your wife's, your first wife's consent. Of course, it's a good thing to do so, but if you don't get her consent, you should at least, you know, at least tell her what's happening because Allah alam, that looks like a betrayal. You know? Some people take it easy, but I don't see it as easy as people might take it, and they'll be responsible for that. Naam. 
No, he doesn't have responsibility towards the kids. It's her, the original father has responsibility. But of course, there is some responsibility. You know, throw them on the side, they're not my kids. Because no, this, yeah, no, like there is, يعني, give and take. But the full responsibility applies on the original father. But يعني, of course, there's some responsibility. Like, for example, he should, يعني, if they're living, if the mother wants their children to live well, they should at least you know, provide something. And it, as I mentioned, it's not about my rights, her rights, you know, her, this is the line, don't go more than that, or don't go, no, 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 give and take, you know, one akhlaqi and manners wise, you know, respect wise, you know, should be above that. Okay, if the father is dead, then it's the grandfather that's responsible. If the grandfather is dead, then his brother is responsible. Because the way Islam looks at it, these are the kids of this man's family that are responsible for them. Okay, But again, as I mentioned, it's not, you know, draw the line, okay, that's your kids and I've got nothing. No, Islam is bigger than that, you know, like, you know, Islam gives and takes. At least morally, you know, akhlaqi, and Islam is above that, you know. You know, that's why I always, when I mention rights, and it doesn't mean, خلاص, we stick to this rights, this is my rights, your rights, that's it. You take it, oh, no, 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 no. This is the lowest you could get to. But you should always wake up to higher. And Rabbi Sassam said, the best among you are the best to their families, and I'm the best person to my family. So we should always come out and try and be the best of people to our family. Be the best of people to others. You know, be the best of people to, you know, your stepchildren, if you want to call them, or those kids of their other wife. Any other question? Any other questions? Do what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you do at the first time? Hello, back in back time. Hello, back in back time. Okay, if the man get, if the man divorces his wife, now he could go and get married. Straight away. If the woman gets divorced, she's got to go through the period. So, the, the, that period or the idda, why she's got to go through idda? Because to clean what's in, in her womb. Like, you know, if, if she's been recently married and then after she gets divorced, she moves on to another marriage and she's pregnant, then whose son is it? So, Islam tells her, clean what's in your womb. Once you clean, okay, then move on to your next marriage. Okay, move on to your next marriage. So, the, 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 the descendants of this kid doesn't mix. Okay, but the only time he's restricted to get married to another one, if he's married four wives and he divorced the fourth one, he can't get married to the other. He divorced the fourth one, so he's got three miskin. Okay, he can't move to get married to the fourth wife until the fourth wife that he got divorced, he divorced finishes her idda. Okay, that's if he's married to fourth one. Okay, Allah, and uh, the most amazing thing is when, when brothers are not married, they come and say, Sheikh, you know, is it halal to get married to third and fourth wife? Yeah, you can get one. But then uh, get to the next one, we'll talk about it later. Uh. No, no, no. The kids don't have rights to stop their mother from getting married. That's her rights. Her own father can't even stop her. Okay, yeah, our father can even stop her for the kids to stop her. And she's disobedient. If the wife goes to work when the husband tells her not to go to work, she's disobedient. She's disobeyed Allah. And he, if he could divorce her on that right, then he, he doesn't have to give her anything in return because she's disobeying him. No. Any other question? Yeah. Last week when we were talking about marriage contract, no one asked anything. Today I was speaking about divorce, everyone's asking, subhanAllah. <laughs> uh, if she's disobedient, like if she's going to work without his consent, then she's disobeying him. You know, that's haram. Okay, he could divorce her and give her nothing. But, yeah, of course, yeah, it's something that you look into. Again, yeah, all these different cases that pop up, there's all these different cases and just thousands of them. You know, every time you hear a new story, it's all, every one, sto every story's got a judgment. Okay? Yeah. The custody of the kids. Allah, the custody of the kids, if they're under the age of discrimination, which is the age of seven, eight, they are with the mother. Once they reach to the age of discrimination, they choose who they want to be. But regardless to all this, 
whether they're with the mother or the father, that does not stop anyone to see the kids every day. Okay, it doesn't mean Allah, the custody is with the mother. Khalas, I'll see my kids once a fortnight. Like, I've got the rest to go and see my son every single day. And that's why Islam says if they're under the age of seven, which the mother has the custody, he's with his mother during the night, but he's with his father during the day. Doesn't need to be toughened up. His mother's not going to toughen him up. He's his father. So custody in Islam, it doesn't mean the custody that we have in this current moment, you, know, Allah, you see the kids once a fortnight. No, custody in Islam, you know, they live with the mother. The father spends on them, but he could see them anytime. Anytime he knocks, I want to see my son. I want to see my daughter. He could take him and she can't stop him. Okay, if, if, he, if, he, if she gets married and he's not married, they move on to him. Okay, if, so whoever is single, they move on to him. And if both are married, then they move on to the grandmother. You know, it's not like that big thing. As I mentioned, custody is a problem in a, in a society that we live these days because they only allow you to see the kids once every fortnight. Islam tells you, okay, custody with the mother, yes, but it doesn't stop you from seeing them every day. Every single day you could go and see your kids, take your kids. You know, as I said, if it's a boy, okay, and he's under the age of seven, the scholars say he's with his mother at night, he's with his father during the day. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day, you know what I mean? But it hurts when it's only once a fortnight, or Allah, once a week. That's when it really hurts. And you know, you're not allowed, okay, Sarai, you're only allowed to go that street, you're not allowed to get to that street beside Sarai. If you get to that street beside Sarai, they could call the cops because they've got an AVA on you and you can't come near the place anymore. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You know? Alhamdulillah. Yes, any other question? No. Can the father Okay, if the father is dead, the, the wali, regardless, stepfather there or not stepfather there, the wali is the father. Father's not there, the grandfather. Grandfather's not there, the uncle. Uncle's not there, her brother or the uncle's son. Okay, if they're not there, then it moves into the sheikh, the imam. The father has got no stepfather hasn't got the authority because once again, okay, this 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 girl that she is his stepdaughter, when someone comes and asks for her marriage, he's not getting married to his family, okay. That's she's not his family, it's not his tribe if you want to call it, okay. She's getting married to that tribe and that makes a difference, you know. This is from this family. They're not gonna say, well, if that stepfather is from family A, and this stepdaughter is from family B. When people get married to her, they did not get married to family A, they got married to family B, that's her family. So they have the rights on who their family gets married to or moves into. Doesn't matter, that stepfather is not her. Of course, yani, yani, at the end of the day, okay, if the uncle's not there, okay, or even if the uncle's there, yani, let's say this is, she's my, Okay, I've got my niece and I'm her uncle and she grew up with her stepfather all her life. Yani, from me, I should say, okay, brother, you take care of it. I could pass on that responsibility. Like if even my own daughter, okay, I'm responsible for her and uh, I'm her wali. I could say to you, you're a stranger. I say, look, brother, you could proceed with the marriage contract on her behalf. Okay, to marry her off, not to marry her, but to marry her off. And uh, you could assign whoever, doesn't matter. Okay, ما الله يوجه جزء سبحانك اللهم حمدك نشهد أن لا إله أنت نستغفر وتوب لك جزاك الله خير فلس. To listen to or download more Islamic lectures, please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au.